All right. Uh, so, Brother Finbar, I have a question just to start right out. Um, could you share with us a Eucharistic story of, from your own life, like a time where you had maybe a profound experience with the Eucharist? Mm-hmm. In, I, have, I don't think you've had Dr. Paharik for class yet, I have not yet in the no. seminary, um, but something she said that she thinks the church needs is uh, Eucharist stories that we share, like our experience. So we had to do it in class one time. It was actually really cool. So oh, yeah. I thought I'd ask you if you have a, either an adoration or a receiving communion at Mass. Mm-hmm. I do. One story that comes to mind, when I was in college, we had at certain feast days, all night adoration and you would sign up for uh, an hour and me being the guy I wanted to sign up for the 2 a.m. Uh, shift. Yes. And I did and an older student who I was friendly with also signed up for that hour. And at this point in my time in college, I was heavily discerning, really wrestling with the question of whether God was calling me to the priesthood. Mm, okay. And so I go into the hour with that mind and I'm praying with the story in first Samuel of of God calling Samuel mm. while he's in the temple oh wow You're... and so the line is you know he, God eventually Eli tells him to when you hear God call me hear the call say speak Lord I am listening and there's that that hymn here I am Lord yeah that is incredibly <laughs> popular used throughout all the parishes in mm-hmm. the United States mm-hmm. And when I was praying with that story, I remember that hymn, and the Eucharist is on the altar, and I open up our hymn book, and I go, and I'm praying with the words of that hymn, and for whatever reason, the other guy starts singing. And of all the hymns that he starts singing, he starts singing, Here I Am, Lord. <laughs> That's wild. So Wow. I have a book it drops from my hands and i just say okay lord you're really here <laughs> man yeah so flash forward to me joining monastery and yeah in formation for priesthood so that's awesome well welcome everyone to all good in the brotherhood podcast um i am as usual one of your hosts brother francisco nate is sadly continues to be absent ugh, at tac soon and very soon um but Joining me today is our very special guest, Brother uh, Finbar, um, who is currently a monk at St. Mary's Abbey, mm-hmm. um, where you, and, but he's studying here at St. Vincent right. for the seminary. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm really grateful that they allowed this Jersey boy to hop onto the, the uh, podcast. So I'm just looking forward to a great discussion. Yeah, that, that almost right there almost <laughs> disqualified him. Um, I make jokes about him being from... The, they call it the Garden State, but like, right? Is I it make really jokes about being in the Midwest out here. Yeah, so, so. we give it right back. Exactly. To each other. So um, we've actually only known each other for about a year, but it's been really cool the way the Lord has blessed already the connection. So um, I asked you to share about a Eucharistic story um, because I think uh, just speaking uh, about the Eucharist is something that. Um, is really essential to what it means to be Catholic, um, but also uh, even more than normal, um, the U.S. bishops have called for what are, is a Eucharistic revival um, to mm-hmm. kind of right. restore um, to the church both the understanding mm-hmm. and the belief of what the real presence is, right. um, but also to remind us that, as the Catechism says, that the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, revival. Um, so this, like, I think the best way to revive is to really, to go back to the roots. Right. Um, so I want to do that today. Let's go, let's go to the roots of the Eucharist specifically Fantastic. in scripture. Oh, so, and what language of scripture are we going to be like, diving into? I don't know, Finbar, what <laughs> language are we diving into? Koine Greek, the, the Greek that the New Testament was written in. Yeah. Um, as you know, you, we talked about, you and I had to take Greek classes mm-hmm. um, so that we could have a strong familiarity with the language of the Gospels that they were written in and the other books of the New Testament. Um, and so hopefully that will help bring some fruit from, uh, yeah. we'll bring some fruit from those into this conversation. Yeah. So the preeminent 
um, part of scripture or the chapter even of scripture to really focus on in understanding the real presence and, and who the Eucharist is, uh, is John chapter six. Mm-hmm. Um, and a real big reason why I invited Finbar to come is because like he said, we had to take Greek. He took a little bit more than we had to. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and he specifically nerd. took an extra semester just so that he could study John chapter 6 in original Greek. Yeah, we only made it through the first three chapters or so because we were just translating John's gospel and by that way learning a lot of the Greek. And yeah, when we got to the end of the semester, we were only in chapter 3, I asked the professor and he said, let's keep going. So he and I did and we made it through um, just about the rest of the gospel in the second semester. <laughs> From three to like <laughs> twenty one, you know, it's, it's that kind of learning curve. You know, once yeah. you pick up steam, uh, he'll true. he'll love it if he if he hears me say it. But it's grief is uh, good. Sorry, Greek is good grief, but good game. <laughs> so it takes a lot of work. So if you're out there and you're listening and you want, maybe I'll try Greek. Try it, persevere. Do it. Do it. Um, yeah, I mean, I was talking to Francisco earlier this week and. Even St. Therese herself, her feast day was sort of this Sunday, right? It was a Sunday. But um, she was really emphatic that if she were a priest, if she were you know, a man and then it could be mm-hmm. a priest, she would study Hebrew and Greek because it gets closer to the, what she said, the, the Holy Spirit, uh, what the Holy Spirit, she said, dictated, what the Holy Spirit communicated to the yeah. human authors. And so... Um, for us studying it so that we can grasp that literal sense mm-hmm. more closely. And then Catholic exegesis, we know, builds off that literal sense first. Yes. And if yeah. we don't get that right, our spiritual senses fall apart. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been my experience. And yeah, hopefully it comes out in the conversation. Yeah. So let's let's talk about some of that literal sense then. Yeah. Um, so you studied the actual Greek. I've, I know the key terms of Greek that are really important to this passage, but uh, just to get us started, um, the lay of the land for John 6 begins with the multiplication of the loaves, Mm -hmm. um, which is really cool. It's the only miracle that actually is found in all four Gospels. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's a reason why, because it's so central to actually this Eucharistic theology. Um, But more, we I know there's some verses later that we really want to get into, um, but at the beginning, Jesus, you know, when he, he, the crowd is coming to him and he says, he asks Philip, um, you know, where are we going to buy bread to feed all these people? And he said, you know, that would, 200 days wages wouldn't be enough for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Andrew says, well, we have these loaves and these fishes. And Jesus says, okay, well, we'll work with that. And right there, when he, we understand, okay, Jesus, while he could, as God, feed them with nothing, he could mm-hmm. literally just conjure up bread, not conjure like magic, but create out of nothing. Because as God, who created the world out of nothing, right. he could do that. But he wanted to work still starting with ordinary means, what yeah. we had, um, and multiplied that. And just the same way, the Eucharist starts with ordinary bread and wine. Right. But he changes that too. So there's already this, right. this Eucharistic um, that Christ will change the bounds of nature but still within the guidelines of them right i love how c.s lewis talks about this in his book miracles um the way in which god does in a particular way what always what he always does Mm. he's always the principle behind everything every motion of the of nature um but he transcends it in this particular way it always is the case that rain comes down waters the earth and Mm -hmm. and grain grows and we Uh, harvest it and grind it up and make bread um but yeah he invites us to to cooperate with that so he asks what do you have Mm. and i think of it like the image of you you have nephew and niece and um we see little kids and their parents invite them to help out even though they're not needed yeah yeah and usually when you invite a a child to help make like a sandwich or bake cookies it takes longer it's less efficient but the kid gets to grow up yeah um and so i see that kind of way that god works through that and that he invites mm-hmm. us to participate cooperate so that we can be more like him because that's the whole idea that jesus is trying to bring us back to his father yeah yeah mm-hmm. good so that's that's where 
we are. So that has happened. And he crosses the sea, and then the crowd follows him again, and then he launches into the Bread of Life discourse. Right. So would you like to lead sure. the way with uh, how that so goes? Guess, and yeah. what, what Greek, particular Greek terms are important here that yeah. we want to look at? So or even have... biblical themes that we need to understand at this point? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to have, I, those of you who are on the video can see the Greek. I also have, uh, or at least my, my workbook, I also have the English to cheat, help a little bit here, just kind of ground me a little bit in the verses. Um, because what Jesus does, is actually then he he walks on the water mm -hmm. in between the two, the, between the feeding and then this discourse. Um, and so the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not gotten to the boat. So they're wondering, well, how did Jesus get mm -hmm. there, right? So there are questions. Um, and they ask, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Mm -hmm. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. This is where he transitions into... Um, the uh, the bread that he's going to give. Yes. Right? That they are coming. You, you're hungry, pretty much, is what Jesus is saying. Um, and it's really interesting. I think of one thing. That's at verse 25. Um, so, I'm trying to think. The word there that, like, that they're looking for that Jesus uses to, to satisfy them. Mm -hmm. um, it's really interesting because it's, I'm trying to make sure I get the Greek right, kortazo. There's like, um, I think of where it is in the, right, because you have opened and because you were satisfied. So Jesus is, the word there is really kind of quite literal. Of they have eaten, um, that kind of they've eaten a meal, and now they're full. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus is is trying to remind them that they're not satisfied in a deeper way, and that's kind of the transition that he's um, inviting here. Um, then when he actually starts to share with them, um, there's it's really interesting. A couple of ways that he intensifies the language. So we'll get to, to the one about eating later. Mm -hmm. But he also, what also happens is the response of the Israelites who are listening, that they start with um, kind of like a questioning. Um, and then, but when he pushes back and doubles down and tells them again that I am the bread of life, I've come down from heaven, um, they not just grumble, but they actually like start fighting. Like the, the Greek is really clear because it's a kind of fighting that would get physical. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. um, so the ways in which we kind of read it in English, like if we read it in English, um, he gets... Let's grab my Bible you know, real quick. Too. Yeah, so reverse... Oh, so those of you listening too, if you want, John chapter 6, starting verses like 25. Um, What, he's, what Jesus does is tell them they're not satisfied. They point back and say, well, Moses gave us bread from heaven. Right. Are you better than Moses? And Jesus corrects them and says, my father is the one who gave them the bread. Mm -hmm. And so now he's challenging the authority of Moses, which is kind of when they start getting to grumble and start to fight. Um, and one really interesting thing about, and he, yeah. he'll mention this, you know, that um, Moses gave you or the Father, you know, gave you manna from heaven, right? Mm -hmm. But but right before this, when he multiplies the loaves and the fishes, um, it at least on John's account, it says he he went up into the mountains or went up into the hills, right? right? Up and up to the mountains for the Jews would have been a place where the Lord encountered them, where they met God, and specifically for the law on Mount Sinai. Right. And where did they first receive manna or bread from heaven? Was also on the mountain. Right. Um, so on a mountain, Christ gives them food, and now continuing this theme on the mountain, he's showing them, well, that's not all of the food that I have to give you. In fact, right. I want to give you manna beyond manna. Right. 
But to the Jews, they're hearing a you know a challenge on Moses' authority. Right. Um, so I want to so the two verses are with us kind of complaining versus grumbling. So in verse forty one. It says, then the Jews, in the English translation I'm using, then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Mm-hmm. So they're complaining, and, and that's kind of that lower level kind of Greek. Then in verse 52, again, our English um, says, because this is after Jesus doubles down, I am the living bread. In verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves. So disputed among themselves. Um, that word is like so in English, it's hard to communicate because um, it's the same word ma- maxomai uh, for fighting, for quarreling. So it's not just disputing like we might think a disputed like question like argument, like, or like a you know, yeah. conversation. It's it's fighting. It's quarreling. It's people bringing out their fists to each other. They're ready to fight Jesus. And I think it just communicates the gravity of what Jesus does. And if you think about, again, trying to get to that literal sense. Mm-hmm. When the author is writing this gospel, he's communicating an event where the Jews understood that Jesus was making strong claims of authority, rivaling Moses. There's, he's not playing this down. Um, and they and they switch to this stronger level, right? Because what he says is, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this blood, bread will live forever. And then this is where he really makes it. And the bread that I will give is my flesh yes. for the life of the world. So that's what he... He really before this he just he did, was still using the image of bread, right? right? And now, and then it says they quarreled among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So they clearly hear they're not hearing symbolism, right? They're right. hearing Jesus really say this, yeah. And if he's challenging Moses' authority, that means he's speaking with a level of authority or with conviction that, right? Whether whether they agree with it or not, they still recognize that he is serious here. Is what he's saying, right? Um, and and obviously a lot of them don't agree with it because um, they're like you said they're getting they're so visceral in their reaction. Right. And just in case you think that flesh is again somehow we're hearing that spiritually, the Greek makes it clear. The word is sarxa, which is the word we word we get sarcophagus from, body, flesh. Jesus is being clear. It's not some spiritual thing. He's doubling mm-hmm. down. He's talking about actual human flesh. And then after it says they quarrel, instead of Jesus saying, wait, 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 don't fight among yourselves, right. like calm down, he says, amen, amen, or truly, truly, like mm-hmm. uh, whenever we hear the word amen repeated twice in gospel, actually, just whenever we hear a word repeated twice, it, right. like you were talking about uh, your experience reading Samuel mm-hmm. uh, and that when he when someone's repeated name, Samuel, yeah. Samuel, Moses, Moses, it's God saying, like, pay attention to this. Right. So Jesus saying, amen, amen. He's like, pay attention. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. So now he's making this even further. You do not have life within you whatsoever. Right. Um, so I think people who try to explain away Jesus here or symbolize what Jesus is saying here um, are really missing the gravity at which Jesus is saying these right. things. Right. And that's what I was saying before, is that the literal sense, you have to get that right. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, your spiritual sense is a fall apart. Um, and yeah, the gospel becomes incoherent. Um, you know, another way that it gets intensified in this passage, especially, mm-hmm. is a shift in the words for eating. Um, yeah, yeah. So this one, I know This you... is like the most important. <laughs> oh my gosh, I get so hyped about this. I think you you wrote like a paper. This was a big part of your paper last year, right? Uh. Well, this was, it was a paper two, two years ago I wrote okay. on something like this. Yeah. So. Well, I wrote a letter actually to someone about this word, try, oh, okay. helping to prove to them why they should believe in the real presence, actually. Right. I was very convicted. Um, but go ahead, since you have the yeah. Greek. In so front I've of got, uh, so in the Greek, so um, the two words that Jesus uses for eating, uh, one comes from, it's phago, it's one word. Um, again, English words, uh, the, you study biochemistry if you a bacteriophage eats bacteria. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, it refers to just eating um, and kind of the eating around a table usually. So it refers to meals. Yeah. Um, then when... And that's eats, the eating he's referring to when he says when your ancestors ate, ate manna in the, desert. in the desert. Yeah. And then earlier when he uses the word for food, it's just like the typical word for food for sustenance. Um, and then we're trying to find out the exact verse. So yeah, verse 50... 
three and then 54. So again, in the English, he says, very truly, we have a translated, I should say, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Then in verse 54, English, we have it translated, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. In the Greek, those words for eat go from being phagate to trogon. Different Greek words. Mm -hmm. So the English misses it, but the Greek makes it very clear. Phago, that's, I already said what that means. Trogon is specifically referring to kind of the gnawing that animals do, especially on, you know, food. Yeah. Right? The kind of gnawing, physical, very animal. Crunching. Crunching, yes. All of that very visceral mm -hmm. eating. Um, the thing, you know, we don't usually watch people do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very rude to watch people gnaw, and you're not supposed to. But Jesus is shifting his language here to double down and say, I need you to want to gnaw on my flesh. Um, that's what he's trying to emphasize. Mm -hmm. And it just in case you think, oh, maybe this is used elsewhere in scripture. Maybe he's using it figuratively. Again, six t this, this verb is used six times across all scripture. Wow. And several of them happen in this chapter. Yeah. So this is not it's a frequent very rare. Word. Yes. Yeah. So shows some evidence of the author intending in Jesus' words. Um, he's being intentional here. Yeah. Which that, I remember the first time I heard, I mean, I, you know, when growing up, you know, Catholic and, you know, believing in the real presence, you know, at least in a, in a mental way saying like, okay, right. yeah, I mean, I'm told that's Jesus. And there's nothing that I, you know, no affirmative doubts came for me to really question what I was taught. But when I really heard for the first time, I think I was in Bible study when I was mm -hmm. in college, when um, we were told like, no, Jesus, Jesus is really saying that they want to like, he wants us to chew on in a way that only you can chew on flesh. Right. Um, and I just thought like, wow, Jesus wants us to be like that aggressive in how we receive him. Like mm -hmm. he wants to like have, have us almost be like, I don't know. I just, the image of it was, was so much stronger to me right. and that there's no way to hide behind what Jesus is saying here. Right. Um, yeah. And then that's again, very clear from their reaction. Cause again, he doubles down and uses mm -hmm. this more intense word. And then this is where in very, uh, in verse 60, they start saying, and many, many were hearing him. Uh, many of his disciples who were hearing him speak, um, Said, this is hard. They said, this is a hard teaching. Yep. This is a hard word. And the word there is logos, which we know has a lot of important oh, yeah. meanings throughout uh, John's gospel in particular. Um, this is a hard saying, a hard word. Who is able to hear it? Um, Jesus, knowing what was in their hearts, that they were saying these things um, about his disciples. And they turn, then, then he turns to his disciples. This is where we as disciples, I think, when we read, you know, whether it's the Pew survey from 2019 or mm -hmm. a recent Kara study about specifically Catholics who, even those who might understand the church teaching, disagree with it and don't yeah. and think that Jesus is just symbolically present in the Eucharist. For us to look at the people who turn away is when Jesus turns to his closest disciples and says, Where, what about you? Where are you going to go? Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting here because, again, the, the Greek, you can read this in English too, but um, there are two different responses that the disciples have, uh, Peter and Judas. Yeah. Um, and let me make sure I get it right. So, Well, even while, while you're getting that, mm -hmm. just to, you know, John 6, 66, which that number carries itself its own level of, in, in, in Revelation, it talks about that's like a number for the evil one, the work yeah. of the evil one. After Jesus says these things, um, it says, as a result, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life hmm. and no longer accompanied him. Right. Now, you would think that if Jesus is trying to restore Israel and he's just said something where he now starts to lose some of his followers, if this would this is the last argument, right, against saying like, hey, maybe Jesus was still speaking symbolically, even if he's using all these strong language. If Jesus really was being figurative, why wouldn't he say, wait, 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 I'm not losing you people over this. Right. Like, no, come back. But what does he do instead? No, he's willing to lose his very apostles over this teaching. Because right. he turns to them and says, 
um, do you also want to leave? And yeah. that goes into then what you said the responses uh, are. It's just it is. He turns to the twelve and he says, "Do you? Yeah. Do you also wish to go?" And Simon Peter answers him, "Lord, where should we go? Um, you have the words of eternal, everlasting life. You hold them. Right. That's the, the Greek. There is actually, you hold them. Mm. Um, like almost in his hand. And we have walked with you, and we have known that you are the Son of God. And so Jesus commends him." Um, not by flesh, um, as has been given to you. Um, what do you think? Oh, testimony. You know, might be cheat and use the English Excel on my men. Okay, go. Verse 70. Jesus answered them, I am not. No. Did I not choose? Did I not choose 12? Mm-hmm. Um, and out of. Oh, and out of one, the devil. Uh, and one is a devil. Yes. And. Then he was saying this about Judas, mm-hmm. um, before he was about to hand him over. So, what well, we can think about why, at this point, this is where Judas gets characterized as the one who's going to hand him over. So mm. Jesus, in the gospel, is making it clear, following him hinges on, on this, this yeah. on this question. Like you said, he's ready to, to lose any followers over this. Um, that communicates to us the gravity of what he's offering and what he's talking about. Yeah, and from uh, talking with Father Nathaniel, who was mm-hmm. your Greek professor um, and who taught me in the Gospel of Matthew Mark, I cannot wait to have this Gospel class with him. I'm so pumped. Oh my gosh. If you um, ever get a chance to be at a, a Mass with Father Nathaniel, listeners, you will hear John's Gospel reference. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we called it, the, we, our class was, you know, Matthew Mark, but we called it the, uh, the Matthew Mark john you know <laughs> there's always something john in it um but he you know because of this reference here to then judas being the betrayer yeah is that this really seems to be the point where judas checks out yeah that judas is like i'm not getting behind this teaching like i thought he was the messiah i thought he's all these things but i'm not leaving but so then then the only reason he stays um is because he had control of the money yeah so his greed kept him which oh it's so it's so unfortunate yeah um but then I mean, this is only John chapter six. Um, now th- we know that you know not everything in the gospel is written necessarily chronologically, mm-hmm. um, but either way, there's still a lot of other things so, that happen yeah. um, to then get to. Yeah, we haven't even had Lazarus yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like so, all these things. Like, yeah. wow. Um, but a, a really important point I think to then add some more biblical context to this. I forgot to mention this before uh, in the feeding of the five thousand. This whole framework john says that this is all happening around passover time Mm -hmm. so he gives the context for when when is jesus instituting this during passover well or at least he's saying these things at passover and when in the other gospels do we find jesus saying you know this is my body this is my blood is at the last supper which is taking place over passover so there's a clear connection here right that Jesus is using Passover, the Passover sacrifice and the Passover meal to show them that he is to be the new Paschal sacrifice and that just as the lamb's flesh was to be eaten, so now his flesh is to be eaten. Um, And looking at the Greek of, uh, if I can remember correctly, um, it's in Luke, but also 1 Corinthians, um, when Paul is recalling, uh, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, or 12. You have to check me on that. But I mean, I could look it up right here. I guess I have my Bible in front of me, yeah, don't I? Bible. Um, but Paul is talking to the Corinthians um, about how Christ instituted the Eucharist. And he said, on the night he was handed over, he took bread, gave thanks, blessed it and broken, gave it to them saying, this is my body, this is my blood. Yeah. Um, but then he also, uh, here we go. It's uh, chapter 11. So I wasn't um, quite right. Anyways, uh, but he adds um, just like it says in Luke, that Jesus at the end says, do this as often as you think of it in remembrance of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that word remembrance is super, super, super important. Because mm-hmm. um, the Greek use is anamnesis, um, which is a very Passover un- like related term. Yeah. So to have anamnesis about something, we hear in English, do this in memory of me. Okay, well, I could remember your birthday by throwing a party, right? But I'm not 
in the party re-celebrating you being born in the hospital, right? right? I'm celebrating your birthday. Right, yeah. I think the way it was explained to me is that the that kind of memory as a video that we play back is yeah. a very modern notion. The anamnesis is what happens when you're around a table sharing stories of someone who is no longer physically with you, like, mm. a, you know, that next Thanksgiving, the next yeah. Christmas, whatever it is. But it's like that person is there yeah. in a way. That's anamnesis. Bringing it back to the moment. Right. So for the Jews, they would have done this every year at Passover. Right. The youngest child would ask the head of the household, Father, why is this night different from all of the nights? Mm. And then his the, the head of the household, what, usually that would be the father, maybe the oldest brother if the father was deceased, would say, well, on this night, the Lord delivered us. And he, he would return back to telling the story of Passover as if it was happening right then. Yeah. Not in saying like, oh, this was, but like the Lord is doing this right now. Mm -hmm. And so they called that anamnesis, remembering, bringing present back to what happened through the action that they were doing. Right. So for Jesus instituting the Eucharist at the Last Supper and then telling them to do this in memory of me, anamnesis, he's saying, when you celebrate this, it is as if you were celebrating it again as the very first time. Right. And what happened on the first time? I said, this is my flesh and this is my blood. And it happened. Right. So when you do it in memory of me, you're not just doing it symbolically in memory. It's right. actually happening again. Right. It's, it's amazing to me because we think about our whole lives as Christians. And I, in, in a real way, our lives as Christians hinges on our acceptance of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Because... We think about all the other sacraments, their power flows from this one. The power that Christ has through the words of the, the human words of the priest to confect the Eucharist is similar to the power when a priest, whoever the minister is, pours water and says, I baptize mm -hmm. you in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When a man and woman come together and they say, I, I vow to you, I promise to be faithful to you, that those words have uh, are effective because... Christ is the one working. Exactly. Them. Yeah. So it just kind of goes all together for for us in kind of an integral way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really important thing for us to remember because we'll be going to mass. I mean, yeah. Brother Francisco and I are blessed to live in a monastery, and mm -hmm. we get to go to mass every day. Um, and the college campus has mass multiple times, um, and every time we are re making that remembrance, mm -hmm. he's really present, and he wants to be present to us. Yeah. Um, he's waiting to ex mm. for us to accept us for for us to accept him. Um, yeah, and that that language we so we say that Jesus isn't represented, but represented. Mm -hmm. So he's present again right. for us. Um, and something for me more and more when I've talked to people who maybe struggle with their belief in uh, the real presence, or maybe Protestant brothers and sisters who it's not part of their tradition or they don't understand mm -hmm. it or just people who they just have no context. Right. When they ask like, why do you believe in this? I mean, I can go through all of this, which, but more I just say, well, I believe that Jesus said it. Mm -hmm. And if I believe who Jesus is as God, yeah. then whatever he says happens. Right. Um, and if you believe that when God said, let there be light, when there was no light and all of a sudden there was, why is it then a difficult step to say, this is my body, right? when it wasn't before? It reminds me of Thomas Aquinas' line in the uh, Adoro Te Devote. Mm. Truth, itself, truth itself speaks truly, or there's nothing true. So even I was talking about the sacraments all hinge on the Eucharist. Truth itself mm. hinges because if, if he spoke something that wasn't true, then there is nothing true, and yeah. that every like the whole world falls apart. Yeah, <laughs> not just not just our church or its sacramental economy and the great, it, just the world. Everything. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. and that's a great point for us in this mm -hmm. podcast, right? The the transcendental of truth. Right. Um, that you know, if if we don't have truth, our lives just fall apart. And who is who is truth? Himself is Christ mm -hmm. and all of his words are truth um, so that if he says this is my body do this in remembrance of me eat my flesh and drink my blood these are truths he is speaking to us and so to to deny them or to say oh he didn't mean it whatever um, is to either make a liar out of Jesus um, or to say well you know maybe in this context he spoke differently or he right. didn't you know it's it just it becomes so strange. And then we can start to pick and choose whatever we want truth to be yeah. in, in Christ and then in the world. Right. Um, 
And that finally, just one more scriptural point, because I just, I just love popping off on this. You're not going to get me complaining um, about scripture. <laughs> is after St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 said, recalls the words of Christ, he says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily mm-hmm. will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. Right. Um, St. Paul is very clear there. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is saying... So we believe in the Catholic, you know, morality and theology that if we go to communion and receive uh, the Eucharist with a state of mortal sin, mm-hmm. then we are permitting or uh, committing a sacrilege, yeah. you know, a, a sin upon a sin. Right. Um, and this is a, a we're basically saying like, Lord, um, I want you to enter like my sinful state, right. which He does desire. You know, it, and it's like, well, the Lord does want to enter our sinful state, yes, but not right. not in this. Right. It's, yeah, it's to assume that, oh, like, it, it's like, the state I'm in, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, it's not scriptural. Yeah, but St. Paul is saying no. And why would he say that if he himself did not believe that what Christ had said before was real? Right. And I think St. Paul adds a really, really good uh, context for that because he was not there at the Last Supper, right? Mm-hmm. And he never actually met Jesus face to face. Right. So this, he says, what I... I a hand on to you was also handed on to me. Mm-hmm. So he received this idea, this understanding of the Eucharist from someone else, you know, probably from the apostles or mm-hmm. from one of the other disciples who taught him. So he already was understanding like, oh, this is important. And this was already been given to him. So from St. Paul, we get this understanding that like, no, it's not something consequential or passing that's happening, but right. this is really happening. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think... Today, for for us, each of us, we've referenced the surveys that people don't don't believe or people just let go of church teaching. And there are conversations in the world about recep- reception of communion. Something that's really powerful and helpful for me is to bring all um, to focus on what I can control, my mm-hmm. own proper disposition for reception of communion. Um, and then we have that wonderful balance of our Catholics who are, we say, yes, we need to be properly disposed and the Eucharist will be medicine for us if we're not in that dead state, which yeah. is the state of moral sin. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that helps me and trust that God appreciates if I go to communion and I'm con- concerned about being properly disposed and in some way God can use that to make reparation against the ways in which his body is not respected. Yeah, um, yeah. And then from that, again, from that, I think it flows the, all the ways in which the body of Christ, the men and women, or the way that people who are you know, unborn or the, un, the vulnerable of this world who are um, disfigured, um, yeah. God mm. can work through our reception to make us holier, but also, as the Eucharist says at the end of Mass does, go. Yeah. Send us out. Mm-hmm. Go be my, my disciples, you know, working for the kingdom of God. And what's another word for the Eucharist is communion. Mm-hmm. So it's communion with Christ, but right. as St. Paul says, we're all the body of Christ too. Right. It's to strengthen our communion together. Right. Right. Um, so if unity, being another transcendental, yeah. To, yeah. to really participate in, in the unity that the Lord is offering to us right. through himself. Right. Um, and I encourage you listeners to go to the paragraphs in the catechism on this because it really emphasizes that unity it highlights especially the poor and the sick. Mm-hmm. You know, the augments are union with the whole body of Christ, um, but especially the poor and the sick. And so those are where um, I think Mother Teresa and her great work, yeah. always informed by a love of the Eucharist and prayer for the Eucharist, which then became the soul of her work. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, yeah, I think yeah. you and I could talk about the Eucharist. <laughs> yeah, we could, we could keep on going, but uh, I think for now we'll, yeah. we'll wrap it up. Um, but just... To, you know, to close, to really encourage all of you, maybe if you've been kind of back and forth in what you understood or what you believe about the Eucharist, mm-hmm. um, to, re- to really lean into the church's teaching, yeah. trust the mother, uh, the church, and, and trust the Father in heaven and the words of Christ right. um, and the continued tradition through the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and also, if it's still a struggle and it's still hard up here, um, you know, a simple prayer I pray a lot is, Lord, I believe help my unbelief he doesn't ask uh, obedience always precedes understanding yeah <laughs> that's exactly. how i go 
So, yeah. Well, thank you for joining us for another episode, and thank you, Father Brother Finbar, for being with us. Um, and we hope you enjoyed today. If you have any uh, further comments or questions maybe about the Eucharist or about Scripture, uh, feel free to send us an email in uh, the description below um, or DM us, leave a comment, do whatever. Um, please like, subscribe, notification bell, all that jazz. You know the drill. Um, yeah, and we hope you have a wonderful and God-blessed day. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, Brother Francisco. I'm glad to be here. Bye. Adios. Adios.